gospel sermon text is Ephesians 6, verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. I will have a prayer for Brother Michael. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father, help Brother Mike to have edifying words to say, and that we will have ears to hear and ponder them in our hearts, so you come again on that glorious day. In Jesus' name, amen. The mystery of the gospel. <clears throat> I want to affirm that the gospel is a mystery, not that there is a mystery contained in the gospel, but the gospel itself is a mystery. <clears throat> The gospel of Jesus Christ is, a, is the message of how God is working salvation in the earth. And it's called a mystery in the scripture because it's a work of God that's unseen by the mortal eye. The effects of it are seen, but the work itself that God is doing is hidden from the mortal eye and the carnal mind. <clears throat> it involves the word that was with God in the beginning being made in the likeness of sinful flesh. It involves the death of the Son of Man as a sacrifice for sins. It involves atonement for sin. It involves Jesus ascending up to heaven and being made a, uh, the great high priest for us at the right hand of God. It involves Jesus being made sin for us and being made a curse for us. None of these things can be seen. It involves the defeat and plundering of wicked principalities and powers. It involves God being pleased by the death of his son. It involves the appearance of the man Christ Jesus in heaven as our representative. It involves the Holy Spirit being sent into our hearts. It involves the transformation of sinful men into dear children of God. It involves the purging of consciences. It involves people believing and being made new creations and being made alive with Christ and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Even though there does not appear to be any change in appearance or location, the gospel of Jesus Christ involves spiritual weapons of warfare. The gospel is a declaration of hope and glory and of the promises of God. And again, all of these things are unseen. Now some people Unbelievers think this is just a lot of silly talk. But the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. For our, our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. The gospel is the truth, and it's the, really it's the only unshakable thing in this world. It's hidden from the carnal mind intellect cannot discover it education and science cannot perceive it it's hidden from everyone except those to whom god reveals it for an example now compare the gospel to the creation of the universe <clears throat> no man was a witness to the creation even though Moses gave the account of it to us, still mo most of it is unknown. Here thousands of years later, we still haven't even discovered all of it yet. Man has not discovered even a fraction of what God created with just his word. He spoke it all into existence. While the work of saving sin sinners and enemies and offenders and rebels from the wrath of God and the end of this world is infinitely more complex than the operation that was the creation. Atonement for sin could not be spoken into existence. Reconciliation to God was not done with just a word. Preparing a wicked heart to hear and believe the gospel was not done with just a word. Bringing a sinner to life can't be done with a word. Providing a savior, a shepherd, a king, and a high priest who is acceptable to God and yet able to effectively understand, associate, and intercede for men couldn't be done with just a word. The gospel is an exceedingly great work of God that is a mystery because it is like God himself. And actually, you know, God is using the salvation of men as a platform to reveal himself. Amen. 
that things that otherwise would not be known. So this is not a small project. God is not simple, therefore the gospel is not simple either. The gospel has always been a mystery, even the very first time it was preached in the Garden of Eden, which is immediately after Adam and Eve sinned. Thousands of years later, when the due time came, if you were there at the foot of the cross and witnessed Jesus dying, if you were to witness his death and then you were to witness him come out of the tomb, if you were to see him alive for 40 days as the disciples did, even if you were a witness to him ascending up to heaven, the gospel would still be a mystery to you. The disciples are a proof of what I'm saying. They walked with Jesus for three years. They heard him teach. The apostle John said, we have heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, we've handled with our hands the word of life. Furthermore, they believed in him. They knew that he came from God out of heaven and they believed that he is the Christ. They had faith. The disciples forsook all to follow Jesus and yet when he died, they didn't get it. The gospel was a mystery. Not only till the Holy Spirit was given did the revelation begin to stream from heaven and they began to understand what happened. They had to be taught and it took some time just like it, it takes time for us to see all of it and we still haven't seen all of it. Even after the Holy Spirit was given, not everything became instantly clear. Full understanding of the mystery of the gospel doesn't happen overnight, not even for the apostles. Years after Jesus ascended up to heaven, there was no small controversy over whether or not the Gentiles could be saved. Now, to you and I, this is a wonderful, well, of, of course, we can go back in Scripture, we see where the Gentiles are prophesied of, and Jesus went to see the Gentiles, and here we are, Gentiles, we're saved. But from, from their perspective, this had to be slowly opened up to them. This is a mystery. What God is doing is a mystery. <clears throat> also, the matter of circumcision was contended about among believers. Decades after Jesus ascended to the throne, there were still disputes about Jewish, Jewish feast days and misunderstanding among some believers. Some of the Corinthians didn't believe there was such a thing as the resurrection from the dead. Corinthian believers who had believed the gospel, is, is there anything more central to the gospel than the resurrection of the dead? The gospel was still a mystery to them. The Thessalonians thought they would never see their brothers and sisters in Christ after they died, and they didn't know how to live properly with the news that Jesus could come very soon. It's quite possible even the servant Onesimus thought that freedom in Christ meant he didn't have to serve his master Philemon anymore. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish believers in Christ who still did not understand the role of the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices and the superiority of Jesus Christ. James wrote to believers who professed to have faith, quite frankly, who behaved like jerks. John had to tell us you can't love God and hate your brother in Christ. Then there are the letters to the seven churches in the book of the Revelation, in which most of those churches were warned by Jesus for their very serious errors. And we could talk at length about controversial issues that still exist today in the churches like baptism, spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues, women speaking in the assembly. What is the church? Is it a hospital for the sick? Predestination, faith or works, law or grace. And what is grace? How are we saved? When are we saved? the second coming of Christ, and the love of God, and whether or not God approves of sodomites. Are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit three persons, or are they one person with three names? How important is the Lord's table? What is primary, believing or obeying? Is there really a lake of fire, and is it eternal? What is the new birth and the new man? What is spoken about in Romans chapter 7? What is justification? What is sanctification? What is redemption? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? There are a lot of people in the churches that can't answer these questions because the gospel is a mystery that has to be preached 
and it has to be revealed and it has to be believed. Now you, I hope you understand, I'm not trying to stir up controversy by bringing up these things. <clears throat> what I'm saying is the gospel is a lot larger and more complex than many have thought. And then there's another category, I guess you could call it, another category of gospel mystery. These are things that are revealed only in part. These are things that we have a, a good understanding of, but we know we haven't reached the fullness or the depth yet. For example, what are all the ramifications of Jesus' resurrection from the dead? What are all the ramifications of Jesus being seated at the right hand of God? What is the inheritance of the saints? Do anyone care to expound the complete inheritance to us at this time? <clears throat> what is the extent of the power of God to usward who believe? Expound the birth of Jesus. How is the manifold wisdom of God being made known by the church? What is heaven like? Have any of us comprehended the breadth and length and depth and height of the gospel? Have we known the fullness of the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge? Are we filled with all the fullness of God? And if we are, can we tell about it? Have we seen all the unsearchable riches of Christ? There are gospel mysteries that are known and believed and experienced, and yet at the same time, they're unknown. After you've been told that Jesus died for your sins on the cross, that he rose from the dead and your sins are forgiven, <clears throat> you still haven't heard all the gospel. The gospel is a mystery. Not that it used to be a mystery. It is still a mystery. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a mystery by its very nature. It's a divine mystery that only God can reveal because it's the message of what God is doing through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote about his commission here in Ephesians chapter 3 to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. But the gospel is a mystery that is knowable. God has intentionally made the gospel a mystery so that he and his Christ are glorified in it. <clears throat> in fact, God intends that men know it. Daniel said he revealeth the deep and secret things. What God is doing through Jesus Christ requires revelation and only those who believe in him are given the understanding. I, I do want to say something about this word mystery. The word mystery is found 22 times in Scripture, and you might be surprised to learn that all 22 instances are in the New Testament Scriptures. Now, you might think that the Old Testament Scriptures is where all the mystery is because things hadn't been revealed yet. But no, we find every instance of mystery is in the New Testament Scriptures. <clears throat> Jesus spoke about the mystery of the kingdom of God. Paul said the partial blindness of Israel and the bringing in of the Gentiles and the salvation of Israel is a mystery. He wrote that the gospel of Jesus Christ is a mystery kept secret since the world began. He said we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. Then there is the mystery of his will, the mystery of Christ, the fellowship of the mystery, the matter of a man leaving his father and mother so that he can be joined to his wife is a great mystery. And I can tell that is because I've heard some people preach that text. <clears throat> Christ in you, the hope of glory, is a mystery that has been hidden from ages and generations. There's the mystery of faith and the great mystery of godliness. Now this makes no sense to the carnal mind if the gospel is such good news and is to be heard and spread throughout the world, then why not put it out in the open, make it very easy to understand so that no one needs help in, in seeing it? Well, this is not God's way. This is the same thing that Jesus' brothers told him in John 7. They said, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples may also see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. In other words, Jesus, we know 
we know you're trying to gather a large following. We've seen the wisdom you've had, you have and some of the ability that you have. Why? Go, go show these things to the people. Do, go to Jerusalem and do some miracles and, and, and show the people who you are. They'll follow you. Well, then John adds this, for neither did his brethren believe in him. Thousands of people followed Jesus not because they believed he is the Son of God, but because he fed them with miraculous bread. Jesus spoke in parables to many people because he had the intent of hiding the meaning of his words from them. And he did this because they did not believe in him. <clears throat> Herod was exceeding glad to see Jesus because he had heard of him for a long time and longed to see Jesus perform some miracle. In fact, Jesus refused to speak a single word to Herod. The mysteries of God are not available to the general public. That is not without a preacher. These people saw the Son of God in the flesh and didn't believe him. The secret things of God are not unraveled by wisdom and intellect. God has hidden what he is doing from the wise and prudent of this world and revealed it unto babes. Who are the, who are the babies that Jesus is talking about? They're the ones that believe in him. God sends gospel preachers. This is God's manner of revealing the mystery of the gospel. It's through the preaching of it. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Contrary to popular belief, the church does not send preachers. The seminaries do not send preachers. God sends his preachers. If the preacher is not preaching the gospel, then he's not sent of God. In the epistles, and especially in Paul's epistles, he writes several times to correct sin and errors in the churches and he detects some of them drifting away from the gospel that would, that would save them. In each case and in each epistle, Paul used the gospel to clarify the situation and to get them back on track. I'll just use, a, for example, Corinth, and I, I won't even go through the whole book, just part, part of it. <clears throat> for example, in Corinth, some were divided, saying, I am of Paul and I am of Apollos. Paul said to them, Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. That's gospel. And ye are Christ, and Christ is God's. In addressing the matter of the fornicator in the church, he wrote, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Concerning taking one another to court over disputes in the church, he said, Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Do ye not know that we shall judge angels? How much more are things that pertain to this life? And again concerning fornication, Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye are not your own. For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's gospel. What about these issues of marriage and divorce and whether or not to marry? He said, but God hath called us to peace. For the, and he said, for the fashion of this world passeth away. And I could continue to go on through the Corinthian epistles and, and most of the other epistles. In each case, this is what the apostles did. They, they brought the people back to the gospel because that's where things are cleared up Amen. is by understanding and preaching the gospel. <clears throat> if the Corinthians would have stuck to the preaching and expounding of the gospel, these things would not have happened. How does Jesus keep his churches holy and blameless? How can sin be kept out 
and increase in virtue and understanding and edification take places in the churches. God sent preachers who open up the mystery of the gospel. The only way someone can hear the gospel is through another person who preaches it and to whom God has revealed it. <clears throat> gospel preachers are like miners. They dig in the word for the gospel treasures to share with us. The one relying on God and the one to whom God reveals the mystery. The labor of the preacher is a labor of faith, trusting that God will show him something new in the word when he puts forth the effort to find it. Now finally, I want to speak about the role of faith <clears throat> in hearing the mystery of the gospel and understanding. I want to tie this in with Brother Dan's message. The word has to be mixed with faith. Otherwise, the mystery of the gospel remains a mystery. <clears throat> As you know, faith is a prerequisite for everything in the kingdom of God. The mystery of the gospel is a mystery that God has made known to men, but only to those that believe. Faith can see and understand what God is doing. Faith can get a good, confident grip on things that are unseen. Faith rejoices at the obscure announcement about the seed of the woman in Genesis chapter 3. Faith can bring us to the foot of the cross with insight and understanding so that we can begin to comprehend the price of our redemption. By faith, we can visit the empty tomb and declare, He is near that justifieth me. By faith, we've stood there with the apostles and watched Jesus ascend up to heaven in a cloud and bless us as he departed. By faith, we can see him seated at the right hand of God. By faith, we can see him coming in the clouds of heaven in all of his glory. By faith, we can see the resurrection of the dead raised incorruptible. By faith, we can see ourselves passing through the judgment with flying colors, so to speak. By faith, you can hear the Father say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. And many more things to come. And I know, I'll even take it a little further, by faith, you've already seen it, haven't you? you you've already seen it. There's a, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, I'm not a preterist. I, but by faith, there's a sense in which you've already experienced it. Because you believe it, it's true. It's the mystery of the gospel is revealed in our hearts. And when, when you have faith and you believe what God said, it's like the whole thing, not instantly, but the whole thing's open to you. And you can go as far as you want. God has made known to us the mystery of the gospel. <clears throat> I want to close with this passage from Romans 16. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all the nations for the obedience of the faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>